We are going to return in our studies this evening to 1 Samuel chapter 4. If you were here with us two weeks ago, we were looking at this text. We had gone through verse by verse, more or less, the entirety of this short chapter. And uh, what we were trying to do is get a, a full understanding of this very, very sad story. We had titled our study, Ichabod, The Glory is Gone or The Glory is Departed. And um, I want to say upon introduction tonight, I do have some stuff I'm going to show you on screen, um, but not as much as normal because I've been having some technical difficulties. So I'm not even going to have all the scriptures up there tonight, but hopefully you'll, uh, you'll understand that. But to refresh your memories on this story, we saw that the Israelites, these particular Israelites, were losing in a lot of fights against their old enemies, the Philistines. And then they got the brilliant idea that they would treat the Ark of the Covenant, which was emblematic and symbolic of God's presence and God's power. They got the brilliant idea to treat the Ark of the Covenant like some sort of magical totem or a rabbit's foot, and they decided that they would bring it from where it was in the tabernacle in Shiloh, where it was supposed to be. They were going to take it away from there and carry it into battle. And they thought that in so doing, they would ensure their victory. And in reality, as we said when we were here last time, more or less the only thing they did was ensure their defeat. Because those that carried the ark, the sons of the priest Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died, as well as a whole bunch of other Israelite men. And the ark itself was captured by the Philistines. And they were worthless, by the way. Yeah, the Bible says they were scoundrels, worthless, useless men, uh, absolute pieces of garbage. Um, but when the, the battle is over where they lose the ark, one of the Israelite runners goes back to Shiloh, tells the priest Eli what happens. Eli falls over backwards and dies. And then when his daughter-in-law hears about him dying and her husband dying, I don't remember if she was wed to Hophni or Phinehas, one of the sons of Eli, she then delivered her baby. She was pregnant. She gave birth to her child and then died. But just before she died, she named her son Ichabod, which means the glory is gone or the, the glory is departed. This is a very sad story, no doubt. The last time we talked about the scope and the sadness of the glory being gone, we briefly looked at the end of the, the chapter, but... This evening, I want to expound on the points of the mistakes these Israelites made and see what applications we can draw from it, because just as assuredly as the Apostle Peter would say in his epistle that there are some people today who are going in the footsteps of Balaam, and they're making the same mistakes as one of the lesser-known figures of the Old Testament, there are people today who are following in the footsteps of these Israelites and making the same mistakes they did, and they are going to encounter as just a grievous end if they don't change and repent, as these Israelites Amen. did. I want you to see firstly this evening, I'm going to reread this story to you, even though I just summed it up for you. I want you to see what I'm going to call the maddening folly, the foolishness of these Israelites. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, again, refreshing your memory about what happened, uh, 1 Samuel 4 and verse 3 says, When the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. Now, notice they didn't say, Let God come and save us. Let's pray about this. No, they're going to go get the Ark of the Covenant like it's some sort of cheat code, that it may save us. Yes. Idiots. Verse 4 says, The people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Uh, we had talked about last time how um, those two were probably the absolute worst candidates to carry the Ark. Uh, as Uncle Dillard said a minute ago, the Bible says that they are worthless. They would, they would abuse their authority in the, temp the tabernacle for sex. They would steal some of God's offerings. They were getting fat off of the meat that was supposed to be sacrificed to God. These guys were dumpsters with legs. They're, they're just garbage. And they're the ones that carry the ark into battle. But then notice what happens in verse 5. It says, as soon as the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout so that the earth resounded. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, what does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid for they said, a God has come into the camp. And they said, woe to us for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us, who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. That's not wrong, uh, being that it was one God, though. In verse 9, they said, Take courage and be men, O Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. 
Verse 10, it says what happened. The Philistines fought and Israel was defeated and they fled, every man to his home, and there was a very great slaughter. For 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell and the ark of God was captured. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Ichabod, the glory is gone. I want to try and expound for you what that means and exposit just a bit of application for you because there are many people both inside and outside church congregations today, and I use the term congregation because not every building with a sign outside that says church, I'm not going to really concede to say that every one of those places of worship is a place where God's Spirit is to be found, but everywhere people gather for worship, be it a proper place or a place that's fallen into apostasy or paganism, every one of those places is a candidate for falling into this same sin if people aren't careful. So I want you to notice some of the things I alluded to a couple of weeks ago. One, they disregarded the help of God. Notice, again, it says that they had gone to get the ark, but they never considered the God of the ark. It's remarkable to me that they decided to go and get this symbol of who God is without actually turning their face towards God and, you know, dying to self and submitting to God Himself. And it is very interesting to say that God will never leave us or forsake us, But it is a rather plain picture in Scripture that when we fail to, you know, heed what God has told us to do, when we fail to abide by what He has instructed us to do, we shouldn't be surprised when He removes His blessings from us. I don't suppose God smiles down on people who are in outright rebellion to Him. I don't think God is going to bless priests like Hophni and Phinehas who were doing the things they were doing. Yeah, it does. I'm here and I'm an elder or I'm a deacon or I'm a priestess or whatever, and I can do whatever I want, and no, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty prevalent problem. I need to fix this. Well, they also so. thought that they had Abraham yeah. uh, as their father, and they only, if I got Abraham, I can, I'm okay. And, and Jesus said that the Jews that were saying that were sons of the devil, but <clears throat> the Bible makes it very clear that we need to not lean on our own understanding. You know, you, you know Proverbs 3. Uh, these people were doing just the opposite. They disregarded the help of God. They didn't actually pray or look to God. They looked to a symbol of God. They also disregarded the holiness of God. They took the Ark of, they took the, Ark of the Covenant and removed it from its holy place. Now, last time we went very in-depth into what the Ark was, what it was for, where it was to be kept, and how it was to be transported. Most of those stipulations and meticulous instructions that God gave were evidently thrown out of the window in these days because God never told them to take it from the tabernacle. That was not part of the plan. They took that upon themselves. They took their own initiative, and in as much, I say they disregarded the holiness of the Lord because they thought they could treat the Ark of the Covenant like it was some sort of four-leaf clover, ensuring their victory like a bunch of idiots. And we know the ark is something that the high priest would go in and splash the blood on on the Day of Atonement one day of the year. It was meant to foreshadow and prefigure the ultimate sacrifice of our high priest, Christ. And they are taking it lightly, and they are disregarding not only the, hope, uh, the, the help of, but the holiness of the Lord. I gave you a, a brief illustration last time about how you can't fit God in a box. Uh, I thought that was pretty telling. I wish I could say I came up with that one. But they, in my understanding, as well as a great many other people who've read this chapter, seem to fall into this practice of putting God into some sort of metaphysical, religious, celestial box. God is this genie in a bottle, and I can rub the lamp, and He'll do what I want Him to do. I'll just go get His ark, and He'll give me the victory, right? When things are misused, there can lead and be, that can lead to dire consequences. Let me give you an example. Something misused. I was listening to a couple of comedians talking about flying, And uh, one of them said he was afraid to fly because he had heard of planes that had ran into turbulence and dire trouble because of birds. 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 Okay, take that in for a minute. Uh, You know, and this comedian had gone on uh, a long tangent about how he would prefer to drive. And when he realized that airplane pilots are leery of birds, he felt a lot of confidence in himself when he realized that if a bird ever came across his car, the car's not going anywhere. I hit a bird the other day, the F-151. But apparently it can be a rather problematic thing for planes, regardless of how big or how small they are, I'm told. 
it, it's jet engines, but it's not just engines. It's actually their windshields, too. Um, believe it or not, uh, when airplanes first began to work towards carrying a capable number of people, they, one of, they had to take in, of course, all the various dangers of the, applic- of the occupants, excuse me, and one of those things was birds flying into the windshield or flying into the engine. So they came out with a, a plan to test the durability of the planes. And I kid you not, they designed this special cannon, and I'm giving you the abridged version, but they would shoot birds out of a cannon at planes to test different things about that plane. Now, I remember career day in high school. I remember, you know, they had the National Guard there. They had some electricians. You know, they had all these different fields. I'm telling you, if they would have had a booth that said, sign up here, shoot chickens out of a cannon at planes for a living, there would have been a line at my school, and I'd have been first. They shoot chickens. It it actually is chickens out of a cannon at a plane to to test the windshield design. Um, And believe it or not, this... This is not a make-believe thing. This is actually true, I'm told. So in England, they began to want to use that same test to test the windshields on some of their trains because they were having similar problems with birds on their trains, I'm told. And uh, they had put out to these people that had managed to figure out how to fire these birds at planes for some sort of scientific test, which I would have loved to have been part of the board meeting that you know, pitched that idea. Jerry, did you figure out how we're going to test the durability of those windshields? Bear with me. We're going to get a cannon. Uh huh. We're going to load it down. We're going to shoot birds at it. You know, these English folks wanted to do it's trains, and so they they got the cannon from the people. They got it loaned to them. They set it up, and uh, they set it in front of this new windshield design. When they fired the bird at the windshield, it went through the windshield, took out half the seat where the train's engineer would have been sitting, and knocked a hole in the metal wall behind the seat. And they were terribly afraid and alarmed, and they didn't know what happened. So they reached out to the designers of the cannon bird test. And uh, upon inspecting the cannon, they were given the following advice about firing a dead chicken. Always throw, thaw the frozen bird before firing it. <laughs> now, firing a chicken out of a cannon sounds like a lot of fun. Firing a frozen chicken out of a cannon sounds like something else entirely. It might as well have been. Yeah, forget the cannons. Just go get all those butterball turkeys sitting in the freezers, huh? I don't know how much of that is 100% accurate, but I know this much. When something is not used for what is, it is designed for, it can be dangerous and downright embarrassing. And there's a lot of times people in the faith today, as well as every other avenue of life, misuse things and disregard the holiness of God. So, The Israelites disregarded God's holiness by trying to use the ark for something that it had never once been prescribed for. Granted, there were Israelites that carried the ark into battle. We talked about that. Joshua and and the Israelites carried the ark around the city of Jericho, for example. But God told them to. But God told them to. Hmm. Amen. (laughs) That's a big difference. difference. Further, the faith and relationship that Joshua had is light years away from what these Israelites had. They had completely gone into the way of apostasy and falling away. Let me give you some examples today, though, of how people might take that which is something akin to the holiness of God and they misuse it. Um, It's all up and down the church. In either side of the extremist spectrum, whether you're being extremely legalistic or extremely liberal, extremely progressive or extremely rigid, there are examples of people taking for granted and disregarding the holiness of God. Let me give you one I had shared with you a couple of years ago from a church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I actually shared this with you last year around Easter, if you remember. Uh, This church, if you would look at their mission statement online, they seem to line up with a lot of the things Christians are supposed to believe. So on their church website, this is the things they affirm. They said, man is sinful and bound for hell if he doesn't repent. The only way one can be saved is through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. The Bible is the inspired word of God and relevant for all time. And in the future, Jesus will return back to this world. That's a little vague, but I agree with all that, more or less. But they have a a few different ideas about the way they ought to do church. So the name of their church, if I didn't say a second ago, is called Transformation Church. And their minister, their pastor, is a guy by the name of Mike Todd. And in regard to the LGBTQIA plus crowd, that's lesbian, lesbian, bisexual, LGBT, lesbian, bisexual, gay, transgender, all that stuff. In regard to that and gay marriage, he was addressing his congregation um, 
about these kinds of things. And he said something that, to me, disregards the holiness of God. Let me show you what I mean. And pardon me if we've got some uh, screen difficulties because this thing has been on the fritz. Uh, and I'm going to try and stand close so that my microphone can pick this up. But he's, he's speaking, I'll remind you again, about uh, gay marriage and transgenderism. Uh, maybe if I should unmute it, it would work better. Uh, let me back up. As I'm working on this, I'm just going to have to summarize what he did on this one. <clears throat> what he's talking about is how he wishes God would have made it so much simpler. He wishes that, you know, God, as much as he had made male, female, uh, he wishes there would have been like a third option. This is not bashing. This is not a... Here we go. My apologies for it not working. He, he, again, he's prefacing what he's saying with, uh, this is not bashing. I'm not trying to speak out against anyone. God forbid you stand for something that's objectively true. Here's what he said. If I was there, maybe I would have told him, is there something in the middle you could do? Like kind of a, like a little when, maybe? If when God made man and woman. Something in the middle? Well, I was born like this. I don't know how I feel. That I, I feel you. And I wish that there was an option of other in the kingdom. In the culture, you can make up whatever you want to. In culture, you can build whatever you want to, but the truth of the matter is that if we are going to submit under what the king says, I'm going to have to wrestle with what I don't even fully understand. Oh, God, the pastors don't say this because they want to be absolute. Well, why did that? I don't freaking know. I know, honestly, I wish God would have made it so much simpler and it was like A, B, C, or D, like frick. No, I'm serious. As a pastor, like, so what do you think about gay men? I don't know. But I do know in the kingdom, They're going to cancel me. In the ca- I'm not the king. I don't, I don't know why he decided to do it like this. I don't know why you're wrestling like that, and I don't know what to do to help you but to stand with you. So uh, I, I could let him go on, um, but I really don't want to dwell on it too much. I show that to you not to, uh, to degrade Mike Todd. I live for an audience of one, all right? And I would assume the same should be said of a different minister or pastor. But the reason I use that as an instance of saying he's disregarding the holiness of God is several reasons. One, he says that he wishes there would have been some sort of third option. If he was with God, maybe he would have submitted or suggested some other alternative. And I'm thinking, well, that's why you're not God. And isn't that just the human being in you, always seeking to want to do things your way and give God advice? You know, the Bible, I forget the text, but it actually speaks of God this way and says, who can give him counsel? Who can, can, you can't give God advice. And he goes on to, and I, I guess I suppose I, I see where he's coming from, trying to be inclusive and loving and such, but he says, um, he's on the, but he says he doesn't know. And what startles me as a minister or pastor is that you should, based on what this says. It's, be, it's very, very clear in regard to what God has decreed about certain sins and certain other things. Amen. The holiness of God is not something He's left us ignorant about. And that's in reality why sin is to be taken so seriously. And I'm picking on gay marriage and homosexuality and transgender and all that stuff, transgenderism and all that stuff, excuse me, because I feel like it's just a simplified version of every other sin. We get caught up and divided on how we ought to look at these kinds of sins, but any sin, no matter what they are, needs to be taken into account in comparison to the holiness of God. This is why every one of us is justly due hellfire and eternal separation, because we are all sinful. And when people start harbingering, you know, uh, a bit of a laxed feeling towards one or any of the other things that would separate you from God, you are disregarding God's holiness. You, are, you might say that you're trying to be more loving. You might say that you're trying to be more helpful. But in the end of the day, what I think you're doing is disregarding the holiness of God. Um, and if I could continue to pick on them, <laughs> they almost make it too easy. So uh, in this regard, in Easter of 2023, you remember I showed you this clip in uh, their play? He had said this. I became the pastor, and I didn't know what a pastor did. And so I was meeting with a group of people, and they was like, what should we do for Easter? I was like, I've never preached the Easter message. So I'm not going to start this year. We need to come up with an Easter play. Yeah, okay. So. (laughs) 
I'm going to spare you the rest of it. Uh, he says they need to come up with an Easter play. Uh, he's never preached an Easter sermon. Um, Men, if you can't preach an Easter sermon, you really need to reimagine and revisit your faith because that's kind of at the heart of it. I don't really recall that part in the Gospels. Uh, do y'all remember me showing this to you last year? Um, when it comes to worship, when it comes to ministry and outreach, there needs to be a bit of an awareness of the holiness of God. You don't disregard God's holiness by turning, in, turning worship into a Beyonce concert. There is an a lot of things we can talk about in this regard, and I'm actually going to be talking about some of this stuff Sunday morning, so I don't want to, you know, get too ahead of myself because there's a lot one could say, and I know I'm running short on time. But I want you all to think about something in regard to worship, and, and I want you to just track with me for a minute. I heard a really good and thoughtful, contemplative uh, preacher put it this way. When it comes to our relationship with God, when it comes to worship, when it comes to ministry, when it comes to living the Christian life, there needs to be a balance to just about everything but there needs to be a balance between two things in regard to God. God's transcendence and God's imminence. If you can think of God's transcendence as His holiness, as God is as high as from the heavens, from the earth, His thoughts are not our thoughts, His ways are not our ways, as high as the heavens are from the earth is, is how different He is from us. There is a measure of God's transcendence that we need to be aware of. When Isaiah sees the, the pre-incarnate Christ in the temple, the train of His robe fills the temple, and Isaiah is blown away because... He is God. In the same manner, God is not only transcendent, God is also imminent. Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered, I am in, I'm in their midst. So there is this high holiness aspect of God, but there's also this close approachableness of God. God is both king of the universe and father to those who have been saved through Christ. So there needs to be a balance between understanding God is so much holier than me, yet God is my father. And when I say there needs to be a balance, consider the two extremes. So for the people that lean too far into God's eminence, too far into the liberal laid back side, you might end up with something like that. Or you might end up with the Jesus is my homeboy t-shirts. Y'all remember those? <laughs> and they, they're the people that say, um, if you want to wear, you know, boxer shorts and, you know, wife beater shirts to church, you go right ahead. You're going to your father's house, right? You wouldn't dress up to go see your dad and God is your dad. That's out of balance. You're disregarding the holiness of God. At the same time, you go too far into the legalistic sphere and you see people who have a view of God that is so far and beyond unapproachable, it's like they're, that He's some sort of hollow statue in the sky. You have people who are far too lax in regard to the way we approach God and they emphasize too greatly God's eminence, but there are those who greatly emphasize God's transcendence so much so it becomes a detriment. These are the people that believe every time you address God... You must speak in a slow and somber way. These are the people that when you go to certain worship services, they say that children shouldn't be allowed to sing, uh, Jesus loves me, or I want to be a sheep, bad, 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 because it's a somber, sorrowful, serious moment, right? We're approaching God. There needs to be a balance, y'all. I, I know I'm throwing a lot at you. It's kind of abstract, but I want you to see what I mean in the regard to this text, that they disregard God's holiness. They run headlong into error. And if I were to spend every minute that I had outlined here to talk to you about this stuff, much more could be said. Uh, like this guy, John Shelby Spong, he's since passed away. I've told you about him many times. He was an Episcopal bishop with multiple doctoral degrees, but simultaneously denied the virgin birth, denied the bodily resurrection of Christ, deny the deity of Christ, deny just about every basic Christian tenet there is to our faith, yet still wore the clerical Roman collar and presented himself as a church leader. He's disregarding the holiness of God. When he would go out and preach that God is a, a feeling and a, and a oneness and, a, and an awakening and an awareness, not the, you know, the one that spoke to humanity through the scriptures and said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob disregarding God's holiness. This guy, Brandon Robertson, another false prophet I've told you about before. He's homosexual. He's come to a place of understanding that Christianity is not incompatible with homosexuality. He's also the same church leader out in California that says he has friends who are in the porno pornographic industry and that pornography is not sinful, it's artistic and beautiful. You're going to tell me you understand the holiness of God when you look at smut and say it's anything less than wicked? Or this guy, Pastor Adam. Pastor Adam gets on my nerves mostly because of his attire. Notice his shirt. Jesus had two dads. Uh, and he said that uh, Sodom had nothing to do with homosexuality. Mm. Uh, in another one of his videos, he had said that there... Oh, absolutely. He had said that there were times where abortion is necessary. 
with his gospel, the gospel of anti-fascist shirt, uh, or this one where he says, uh, God is a she who loves you. Um, yeah, you're disregarding the holiness of God. Amen. You are taking for granted that which God has not left anything up to your imagination to be understood. God is clearly spoken, and if we believe God is clearly spoken, then there is a reason for that, one of which is that we are to see and understand who and what God is meant to be understood as. I know that sounds kind of redundant and a bit circular, but put plainly, God is to be taken seriously. Amen. I want you to see, thirdly, they are also denying and disregarding the, the heart of God. And I think this, whereas those that disregard the holiness of God, I think are too liberal I think there are those who disregard the heart of God and have also become too legalistic. This is like the church in Ephesus of Revelation 2 where Jesus rebuked them because He said they left their first love. They had become so entrenched and ensconced in their legalism that the heart of the gospel had all but fizzled out. These are the people who get more upset about the color of the carpet than they do about someone being brought to Christ. These are the people who will fight you tooth and nail over minor things that should be, a not, that should be non-issues, but they become, you know, matters of life and death in regard to some people. Um, I, I look at the Israelites in as much as disregarding the heart of God, as much as the help and holiness of God, because they're only concerned with themselves. They said, we're going to go get the ark so that God can grant us victory. God gave their ancestors victory because He had promised that land to Abraham, and He had a reason for it. It wasn't for their vanity. It wasn't for their own glory. It wasn't for their credit. When He helped Joshua smack down the walls of Jericho, He had them walk around it and play music. And there's a lot of reasons for that, I'm sure. But one of my favorite ones has to be, has to be, so they know it wasn't them. No one marched around the walls of Jericho, hit a high C note on one of their ram's horn, and their buddy next to him said, Way to go, Hagim! That was a really solid note. You really did your job? No, because they knew it wasn't them. Those Israelites had a better understanding that their lives in this world has as much to do with one another as it does with God. You can become too, legal, you can become too liberal, but you can become too legalistic. The Bible says in Micah chapter 6, He has told you, O oh man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? That's one of the main problems with people who are too far ensconced in rigidity and legalism. They're always worried about themselves, what appeals to them, what matters to them, rather than what they need to do to serve others. Um, a lot more can be said about this, y'all, and I'm almost out of time. We're going to have to make a part three out of 1 Samuel 4, because I wanted to tell you the glory being gone is a result of all these things. People disregarding God's help, people disregarding God's holiness, people disregarding God's heart. Uh, and it cost them. Cost them dearly. 30, As I said two weeks ago, Ichabod can be written over a nation. It can be written over a family. It can be written over a home, a church congregation. It can be written on individual lives. Um, I wanted to talk to you about those modern followers of these Israelites is as much as their marvelous folly. Um, we're going to come back next week. I, I don't want to miss this because I think it is to be taken as seriously as it is inscribed and eternally immortalized in Scripture for us to learn from, that we ought to see God is not to be treated this way. Um, I don't know if there's any moments in your life where you thought you should take it on your own initiative and, you know, do things your way. I've done it. I, I am guilty more than any probably of saying, I've got an idea, I'm going to fix this. You study the differences between men and women, and that's actually one of the genetic characteristics of men. We naturally want to fix things. Uh, rather than just listening to our wives' problems, a lot of times we're trying to just listen for a solution because we want to fix it. And me, being the pig-headed, arrogant guy that I am, a lot of times I come up with an idea. I'm like, well, we should do this. Some of you I've talked to, you, you may have seen my impulsiveness or impulsivity, if that's a word, how, in, how quick I can be to decide to do something. I'm going to do it now. I went to my mom and dad's house two weeks ago, and they have a very, very thin roofing on their porch. And part of it, before they had gotten their roof redone, had become damaged because of water, and it was beginning to, to peel in one spot. And each one of these sheets of very thin plywood is about four by eight feet. And I took it upon myself. I looked at it, and I said, I'm going to fix that. <laughs> Literally the next Monday, this was a couple of days later, I had gone, and in the middle of the night, I'm sitting there working on this ridiculous job in the frigid cold because I knew there was a cold front coming last week. And I was doing this at about 9, 10 o'clock Monday night. And it's all because I'm an, I'm an impulsive idiot sometimes. 
And my mom and dad are telling me, go home. You don't need to do this right now. And I'm thinking, I need to. I got to do it right now because I'm not going to have time to do it later. I've done that so much without involving God, without saying, God, what would you have me do? They took it on their own initiative. I don't know if you've ever disregarded the holiness of God. and what you call running before God. Oh, yeah, I would say. I'd say. I don't know if you've ever taken for granted and disregarded the holiness of God. Um, I remember we were in Turkey Creek some years ago, and there was a, a guest speaker brought in. You'd know him if I told you. He was trying to make a point about 1 Corinthians 13. Um, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 that if he can move mountains and delivers himself up to be burned and can speak in the tongue of men and angels and understand everything, but he doesn't have love, he's like a noisy gong, right? So what does this guy do? To make an emphatic point, he walks from around the pulpit, walks to the communion table, grabs the two lids from the communion trays and clangs them together like cymbals. He says, oh, Paul says, I'm just a noisy symbol. And everyone's like, what are you doing? Don't do that. This isn't band class. <laughs> Needless to say, there were a lot of people who were understandably upset. And to a certain extent, I don't believe in transubstantiation. I believe in, you know, I don't believe in the real presence of the Lord's Supper, but the Lord's Supper is a very solemn, special, holy, sacred time. And I don't suppose we ought to use the lids on the trays as symbols no matter how much of a good point it would make. Yeah. To his credit, I've never forgotten that. <laughs> I wouldn't advise it. And I would be willing to admit and bet there's as many of us who have not only disregarded God's help and God's holiness, but maybe God's heart. Maybe we've gotten a little too involved with the person we see in the mirror. And maybe we're a little too in, invested in what's best in our world and what we see. Um, it's integral and absolutely dire that we learn not to make these mistakes, y'all. Because God's glory departed from Israel that day. I don't suppose he'd hang around if they would have, you know, kept on keeping on in what they were doing. And I don't blame him. And when I see churches out there with their doors closed, it only makes me wonder what people were doing to cause Ichabod, cause the glory to be gone. I don't think churches closed because someone can't pay the light bill or because there's some sort of natural disaster. I think God can lead and direct in such a way that church doors close because the glory has departed. Because at the end of the day, the church is not this place. It's, it's not the building. The church is you. That's why we say there's one church. God has one people. And um, Andrew's going to come up or, and, and uh, lead us in another song in a second. But y'all go home, pray about this, and I pray it can never be said of us. It is a sad story's ending, but we know there's more to it. I do thank y'all for your attention this evening. If there's nothing else y'all want to add to this. I apologize for being so scatterbrained tonight. Thank you.